Welcome to MindShift, I'm Brandon. Today is another Sunday episode and it's a special one because we are doubling down off of last Sunday's video. Last Sunday I covered 20 common commands that are made in the New Testament only that Christians seem to almost never follow, despite them being either the clear commands of Jesus or of the apostles. No Old Testament excuses here. I'm going to give you another 20 today, but before I do, I want to cover some of the reactions I got from the last video. If you're not interested in that and you just want to get straight to the new 20, then go ahead and click to where the timestamp is. Is below. For those of you still here, I think it's really interesting to evaluate the kind of responses that I got from Christians. Granted, it's probably a vocal minority, as many Christians just didn't see the video, and the Christians who do watch the atheist side of YouTube are probably more in the argumentative space anyways, but it still fascinates me. Now, there were a couple Christians that said, hey, you're right, this is a good call out, we should be doing better. Great, I appreciate that. The whole point of it was not to say that Christians should never sin. It's the active lifestyle choices that are in direct opposition to what is found in the Bible in the New Testament that are promoted for everyone, which leads me to the main secondary response that I got, which was you're taking that out of context. Many people pointed to the verse that I mentioned about giving all your possessions away, and they said, well, that was Jesus speaking to one individual man. Granted, I thought that was obvious. I knew that when I listed it, but doesn't it show us Jesus' his heart for those who follow him? Well, it was specific to that man's sin. See, that was a rich man who was greedy, and so Jesus was saying for him, in his case, he would need to do this. Okay, fine, but is it not applicable then, contextually speaking, to say, especially in regards to all of the other verses, a few of which I read, about how we need to be content with nothing more than food and clothing, not to live in excess, etc., to understand that Jesus's heart is to be willing to deny yourself the things you want to better serve his kingdom? Like, I think that's what's baffling me. Like, like, what are you arguing for? The right to sin? The right to be greedy? The right to have more than your neighbor? The right to avoid the suffering that Jesus promises you will have if you truly follow him? Are we not all called to be disciples? Probably 16 or 17 of them, no one said anything about. And I think that's because there's no justification. There's no context. This was Jesus or Paul or Peter or someone speaking to everyone. This is a straight up command, like pray without ceasing. Give thanks for everything. There's nothing to be done with these verses. They're just clear cut examples of Christian not doing what they're told. But on the two or three that you could talk about some context or some individualism, I still think there's no argument there whatsoever. I'm not trying to be difficult and I'm not trying to not understand. If the creator of the universe, if the person you trust with your eternal salvation, if the person you're supposed to love tells you to do something or forget the command side of it, says that it's better to do X than Y, why choose Y, right? Like that makes no sense to me. Another huge response was, Brandon, you're being too literal. Don't don't you know it's all about love and faith? Being too literal, at some point, I understand that the Bible in its entirety, in its collection, in its canonization, cannot have every single word taken literally. There is metaphor, there is poetry, there are allusions, etc. Like, okay, granted. That's why we're not even talking about stuff in the Old Testament, because it's too convoluted for the modern Christian to just not make excuses for. But New Testament stuff, when we have quotes from what Jesus said, and if you believe those quotes to be accurate, which most people believe the Bible to be true. I understand if you're like, well, we don't actually have any proof that Jesus said these things. If we're going down that road, which some of you tried to go down, let's just get rid of the Bible. Let's just stop having religion. This is all under a certain pretense that the believer actually believes that the Bible is a valid source of truth and that what it says in it means what it says. All that being the case, how can you be too literal when Jesus says, forgive as I have forgiven you? Where's the metaphor? Where's the hidden message? I, I don't get this excuse. And even, let's just grant it for fun, the only thing that matters is loving Jesus. Do you know what Jesus literally said it is to love him? It is to obey his commands. So if all you want to do is love Jesus, you should be pouring through what Jesus said to do and doing those things. The last category of responses that I got were, well, you just expect people to never sin then. Like we're going to mess up. No one can measure up to Jesus. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus didn't say, I'm perfect. You're not. So don't try. He said, I'm perfect. You're not. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But here's what to do. Not here's what to think. Not here's what to believe. Do this. Be this. What a cop out. Imagine Imagine doing that with any other kind of system that you're trying to follow. You go to school, you're trying to graduate college, you have to pass your final exams, and you say, no, this is too literal, first of all. What really matters is the heart of knowledge, whatever that means. Surely these teachers don't expect me to know every single answer that's going to be on the test, so I'm just not going to do any of it. And they should still recognize my heart for learning and pass me. 
Nope, that's not how anything works. The very last and second part of this is people would say, Brandon, you have no right as an atheist to critique how the Christian thinks, believes, or acts. Wrong. What a dumb thing to say. First of all, I was a believer for 30 years. Second of all, what believers think and do affects me. It affects everyone. It's a lifestyle. You're trying to bake these moral goods into our society via how you vote and the laws and rules that you want passed. So I think it's more than fair for me to call out, hey, before you try to instill the values that you say are so good onto our society, most of which are coming from the Old Testament out of context, why are you refusing to follow the things that Jesus himself said would be beneficial in the New Testament in context. If no one can critique anyone that thinks differently than them, then everything falls down. Period. I really believe, and this is the last thing I'll say and then we'll get into the 20, I really believe that the clearest cut thing we should be able to get to, believer or non-believer, different denominations of religion, etc., is that if the person who you're putting your trust, faith, love, and hope into the creator of the universe specifically shows and tells you the better thing to do or commands in certain cases to do for you or for anyone. And in many of those verses, it was addressed to everyone, to followers of Christ. Why would there ever be an excuse not to? There will be human failing to do so, sure. There will be times when you mess up, of course. But why would you not do or try to do or intend at the very least to do these things? Why arguably go against them? It truly escapes my understanding. Okay, but let's get into 20 more and I'm going to try to be even more specific and concise with context this time. Let's start with Matthew 6, 5 through 6, where we are told to pray in secret. We should pray in hiding, not like the Pharisees who do it on the street corners, for they receive their reward. You want your prayers to be heard? You should do so quietly by yourself with the door shut. How many Christian you YouTubers and apologists and pastors and preachers pray right there on the screen for the whole world to see. How many do go out on the street corners and pray and kneel down and things of this nature and pray in public? It's inexcusable. It's right here, a command for all believers. How about Matthew 5, 33? Do not take an oath, not by heaven nor by earth. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. How many people swear on the Bible? How many people make special promises or oaths to mean something more? Christians swear oaths all the time time. Like it's some kind of secret one up ends on truth. But God is very clear. Your yes is your yes and your no is your no. For the next one, I'm going to read to you straight from the Great Commission. Now, he is talking to the apostles here, but in context, it goes on to say for anyone who believes. And so in Mark 16, 17, he says this, and these signs will accompany those who believe, period. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up serpents with their hands, and if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick, and they will recover. Go drink some poison. Wouldn't this be an awesome litmus test? Every Christian, everyone who believes, drink poison. Poison. Well, God doesn't like to be tested. No, he loves being tested. Tons of verses. We'll do a whole nother Sunday episode on that. Drink poison and whoever's left is the real believers. Wouldn't that be crazy? Do you believe you can heal people? Do you speak in tongues? When's the last time you casted out a demon? Oh, well, that's that's for like the super evangelical. Did Jesus give division here? I, I don't understand. For all those who believe, you can do these things in my name. And then we saw that happen. We saw them doing great works according to the Bible. So do you just not believe those things happened or they happened for them, but not for you? Was Jesus different 2,000 years ago? Like, what's going on here? I'm going to interject to say, in case anyone didn't see the last video, or how easy it is to forget, according to all the comments that I got, my goal, I know I'm talking like a bit sarcastically here, it's not to shame anyone, it's to point out the insanity that it would be to actually believe this text and do what it commands. I don't want people to do this. I don't believe that most of the things Jesus says to do are beneficial. Some are, for sure, to the group, not the individual, and some are very, very, very harmful. If you're a Christian who doesn't do these things, I get it. I really do. It's a level of self-preservation or a level of like, this is insanity. No one can really do this. No one should really expect to be doing this, except that that's what your creator of the universe that you love and serve says. So I'm just looking for a little bit of consistency. And if we're not willing to say, hey, that's obviously harmful out loud with our mouths, but you secretly somewhere deep down know it, why have you not yet made the distinction for yourself that this is either untrue or 
immoral and harmful? Why are you still pretending that this is good news? That's more along the lines of what I'm wanting to show, not to shame you and definitely not to encourage you to do these things. In Luke 12, 35 through the rest of that chapter, I believe we get Jesus telling a parable and Peter even interrupts and says, wait, is this parable for everyone? Yes. So there goes that. And it's Jesus talking about how we need to be ready for when he comes back. And he gives an analogy that the people of the day can understand, which is the slaves being ready for the masters when they come home. And within that analogy, he talks about the two different ways that slaves should be beaten. The ones that are beaten harshly because they're doing the wrong things and the ones that are beaten lightly because they're doing the better thing. So this verse is fun just to point out that Jesus totally condoned the servitude or slavery that was going on of the day and permisses you to beat your help. So call them indentured servants, call them workers, call them whatever you want, beat them. Jesus is okay with it. Do you beat your workers? What if they've done the wrong thing? Then surely they are worth giving a harsh beating to. We're unwilling to follow Jesus in the good things and the bad things. What does that say about our morality versus the objective morality of the Bible? Here's a fun one that I see broken on a daily basis as I see apologists and Christians fight amongst themselves. 1 Timothy 5 1. Do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a father, younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, younger women as sisters, in all purity. All I see are Christians rebuking other Christians. It's also interesting because in this very same book, 1 Timothy 3.16, it says that all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So I don't blame you if you didn't know which one to follow, but here we see that we should not be rebuking one another. Don't go two chapters back, though, because it'll say to rebuke each other. Ugh, it gets messy. That one's really not your guys' fault at all. In fact, none of these are your guys' fault because they're either inconsistent, contradictory, impossible to follow, or harmful if you did. Here's a fun one. It comes in Mark 10, 15. This is right after he got done doubling down down on divorce. He says, let the children come to me, which sparks his memory. And he says, truly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And in the context of what Jesus has said about children, how then do we receive and enter the kingdom of God? To believe without evidence, without argument, just going off pure gut conviction because a higher power told you so. He's making a guarantee, this is to everyone, this isn't contextual here to one individual, that if you don't believe like that, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. And yet we have nothing but scholars and intellectuals and apologists, even Paul setting the stage for us very early. He goes on to say, when I was a child, I thought like a child, but now as a man, I think like a man. And goes on to use his reason and intellect. After all, he was a Pharisee in his former life. But Jesus warns against this. It seems to me there should be almost no intellectual, philosophical, theological arguings for this. You have a book, believe it. You hear a story, take it as truth. Will that get you in trouble? Absolutely. And it's not like the intellectual defense of this is going that well anyways. So might as well make sure you at least get to go in the kingdom of heaven. I wouldn't risk it trying to sound smart. Why we're here in Mark 9 42, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell, to the unquenchable fire. Brandon, that's metaphor. Hell there is actually translated as Gehenna, which was just this nasty place that you didn't want to go to. We can argue about hell all day. I had a video come out last Tuesday. If you didn't check it out, give it a look. But Jesus is saying, take drastic measures to avoid sin. Don't cause others to sin and don't let yourself sin. And if there are factors that are causing you to sin, remove them. So I'll even go on the metaphor with you here. If you have a girlfriend or a boyfriend and they want to move in before marriage and it's going to cause you to sin, break up with them cut that arm off. And yet how many Christians are unwilling to do this? And that's one tiny example. Most Christians do not think they should have to, or it is necessary to make drastic decisions in their life because sin is just sin. We all sin. We'll get forgiven of it anyways. So why would I go so drastic with it? Because Jesus tells you to. Here's a really interesting one. This comes from James 1, 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach and it will be given him. How many of you want to be smarter, want to be wiser, want to understand God better? Just pray. How many of you have ever prayed for wisdom? It's here in the Bible. You should have read your Bible and either you have chosen not to pray for that, which I can't understand, or you've chosen to pray for it. And for those of you who have chosen to pray for it, do you feel you receive 
received it. I think there's a whole sliding scale to examine there. Okay, this is Jesus speaking to his disciples, but again, I would say we're all called to do this. This is Matthew 16, 24. If anyone would come after me, anyone does sound pretty open there. Let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. As a side note, it's just a few verses later where he says to his disciples, truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Now, I point that out for two reasons. One, I think that Jesus is obviously telling anyone who wants to follow him, who wants to be a disciple, who wants to be like him, that they need to deny themselves. And I see so little denying of self in the Christian worldview, and not just in their actions, but in what they believe they need to do. I see a ton of prosperity teaching, and it is okay that I have this, and it's okay for me to have this pleasure, and I don't need to give this up, etc., etc., etc. And then what's so funny to me, you can't have your cake and eat it too here. That prophecy of Jesus, where he says to the specific disciples in front of him, I tell you, truly that some of you here will not taste death before I come back. Obviously that didn't happen. They all died. Jesus still hasn't come back 2,000 years later. And one of the main excuses for that lack of fulfillment of prophecy is that Jesus wasn't just speaking to them. He was speaking to all disciples, that he was speaking to everyone, anyone that would be a disciple anytime in the future, and that some of them would then not taste death. So either you need to take this extremely literally, which somehow I'm the one getting accused of this, and believe it's only for these individual men, about denying yourself. And if you do that, then you have to admit that Jesus failed his prophecy. Or admit that Jesus' prophecy was for everyone, then so are his commands in the preceding verses within the context. And take up your cross, deny yourself, and follow him. So simple. Let's go back to Matthew and talk about lust. Matthew 5, 27. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Once again, he says, if your right eye causes you to sin, and tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. So we have a doubling down on taking things drastically and seriously. We also have a not like parallel but a true equating of lusting after someone being the same as adultery. So I wonder, men who are watching who are married, who claim to be Christian, have you ever once glanced at a woman with lustful thoughts or intent? And if so, you have committed adultery. Have you gone and repented for being an adulterer? Have you confessed to your wife that you committed adultery? Jesus is not saying these are similar. He is saying these are the same. This is where we get thought crime from, which no Christian likes to admit. But we see it in more than just this example. So for the next one, we'll just go back to Matthew 5, 21. You have heard it said that those of old you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you, everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. So this covered two things I wanted to say here. One, if you're angry, you've committed murder. Should you go down to the jailhouse and turn yourself in? Jesus says you will be judged the exact same way for the anger in your heart as you would for the physical act of murder. Should we be telling our lawmakers that anyone who has been angry with their brother, their friend, etc. needs to be on trial for murder? Would you go that far? P.S. Here's just a handful of things I got called after my last video. Clown, kid, pathetic, fool, stupid, dumb, ignorant, weak, a liar, and a demon. One of those things was a fool. The others were like being called a fool. And it says right here, if you call someone a fool, you'll go to hell. Don't call people fools. Don't have anger, even in your thoughts, and don't have lust, even in your thoughts. I don't know if we'll count this as three or one, but it's all right here, and it's all from Jesus. I'm going to hop in the abstract mud with all of you for just a second, but this verse has always struck me, and I wanted to call it out. Luke 17, 5. The apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith. And the Lord said, if you had faith like a grain of mustard seed. You could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea and it would obey you. Is this Jesus just to the apostles because they're going to have greater works than us because they were around him because of vicinity magic, which absolutely happens. Look at the people who touch the cloak of Jesus or the handkerchief of Paul and are healed. So yeah, maybe it's just for them. But in the different times this is given through the gospels, it really looks like Jesus meant even the smallest amount of true sincere faith could do great 
things. And I think the modern Christian does not believe that they are capable of these things. Or the modern Christian really believes they're capable of these things. And then it just falls down so hard around them. There's a really fun clip of all of the prophets who prophesied that Trump would win over Biden. I think it's put on by Holy Kool-Aid. And you see all of them pre-election, 100% speaking for God. This is true. We have faith, so it will be done. I have heard for the Lord and it is so. And then obviously it just didn't happen. Where did they all go? Are we not going to rebuke them for being a false prophet? Anyways, I digress. That one's probably a nothing burger. I don't even know if I'll keep it. Let's move on. This one is a little bit of a doubling down on the one that got called out most in my last video, which was when Jesus is telling the rich man to sell everything he has and give it to the poor. And so I wanted to read to you what we saw his believers, people that actually believed, not just that rich man, by the way, but people who took this seriously did. This is in Acts 2, 42. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, and all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. So we get not only that Jesus told the rich man this, but he told the apostles this, and the apostles went to preach it, which shows me that this message is indeed meant for all, which is one of the reasons I wanted to read the verse. But furthermore, we see that they actually, the people who followed the apostles, that would be like us, they did these things and it was counted good unto them. We see them living it out. Acts is the best representation of what Jesus, Paul, the apostles, everyone expected the new church to be acting like and doing, and we see almost none of it today. Why? Why are we unwilling? Why do we not believe? Is it because these things simply do not ever happen in the way that God tells them they will? Or we're just not willing to take up our cross and deny ourselves? I have two left. I hope I hit 20 or maybe I went over. I really don't know, but let's go to Luke. Here's Luke 14, 25 through 27. Now great crowds accompanied him and he turned and said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Skipping down to 33, so therefore any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. He is speaking to a group of people in front of him, but he is also speaking plainly that this is what it is to actually follow me. We have discipleship classes in church today because it is different than just being saved. Salvation and being justified before God is different than being a disciple of Jesus, to be more Christ-like, to do the things that Christians were called to do, to speak in tongues, to heal, to cast out demons, etc. And Jesus is saying no one gets to be a disciple if they're not first willing to deny themselves and everyone else in their life. Well, Jesus just can't have meant that. He... Marriage is supposed to be a representation of him in the church. He wouldn't want to sac. Yes, he would want us to sacrifice it if it meant getting in the way of following him. Absolutely. That's why both he and Paul were not married. And Paul even says that if you want to serve the Lord better, you should not get married. It's truly radical what Jesus expected of the people who said they loved him, that they would obey him, and that they would follow him, which is how I'm going to end. I'm going to end with the Great Commission. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. It doesn't get more clear than this. Yes, Jesus is talking to his disciples, but he tells them to tell the people they're going to tell to observe all all that he has commanded them to do. This one verse, I think, takes away the entirety of the excuses that came to me off the last video. Jesus's commands are for everyone, and he expects everyone who hears those commands to obey them. Case closed. That's it. Why are you arguing against it? How little do you believe your maker? How little do you believe your own religion, your own Bible? There's no context issues here. This isn't Old Testament weird Levitical law. This isn't even bad in comparison. It's not like I'm telling you to go out and buy slaves because Jesus said to. I'm saying, go be a missionary. Go to the unreached nations who have yet to hear this message and tell them. Be obedient. Well, I can't because of this, this, or this. Then deny those things. Leave your family. Leave your kids sell your possessions so you can get the money to buy the flight jesus accepts no excuses if there's something getting in the way cut it off there is no greater purpose than to love him which is to obey him and to obey him is to go and tell others to do the same and if anything gets in the way get it out of your way if you are unwilling to do this i plead with you don't consider then doing it consider why you won't is it because deep down you see the holes and the contradictions and the errors and the harm of what it would be like to actually live this way is it because it's more about a social club to you and fitting in with the status quo of our time and how we interpret the bible which is much more light and airy and fluffy and loving 
living and cherry picking your own way through Christianity, some things are black and white. There's a ton of gray in this Bible. There's a ton of metaphor and poetry and prose, but some things are black and white. If you believe that God is real, if you believe that you owe him a debt and that Jesus paid that debt and you need Jesus for salvation and you want to show Jesus that love, you obey him. And if you're unwilling to, then just stop calling yourself a Christian. Stop saying you love God. Stop saying you're thankful for the salvation that you've received from him. You're not. And I'm not saying you're not a true Christian. I'm saying no one's a true Christian because none of this is real. So stop taking the parts that you like or that are beneficial if you're unwilling to go all the way. And if you're unwilling to go all the way, let's call a spade a spade. That's it. I've said it. I've said it. I've said it too much. I apologize. I'm done. Thank you for being here. Thank you for watching. Have a wonderful day. Let me know your comments down below. Can't wait to hear the excuses and the name calling for this one. I'll see you Tuesday with a great video. And until then, keep thinking. I wanted to personally thank my top tier Iconoclast patrons, Sean Skaggs and Jason Rollins, and my atheist advocate patron, Jared Nichols, for their incredible generosity. Also a big shout out to my secular scholar patrons, of which we have some new ones. All other patrons are listed in the description of each video. Please consider joining this great group if you enjoy these videos or believe in my mission. Thanks and have a great day.